I have figured out a way to steal $20,000 back from the government using my house. And you can do. Welcome to An Architecture, the built environment of a stateless society. My name's Tim. I'm an architect living in Boston. And I'm Joe. I'm Tim's brother, and I'm an engineer living in Adelaide, South Australia. For a long time, my wife and I have been thinking about putting solar panels on our house. We've always been interested in solar, but with our current house, at least when we bought it, we kind of figured we might be here for five years or so and then move on somewhere else that might be more permanent. At this point, we've now been here for eight years, and it looks like we might stay a bit longer. Is that because you bought in 2005 before the bubble popped <laughs> and you stuck with underwater? <laughs> no, where I am now, the market right now is crazy oh, right? yeah. in Boston. Yeah, it's like people are, when houses go on the market, they go on the market Thursday, they have an open house Saturday, open house Sunday, and accept all bids by the end of the day Monday. Jeez. And if you don't get a bid in, you don't get the house. <laughs> and someone will get it, and, and they, get, they get bid up over the price. It's crazy right now. Wow. Anyways. Sell. Sell, sell. But we're not selling. <laughs> no, because then we got to go buy another place somewhere else. we get the same <laughs> freaking problem. So we're thinking a little longer term about our house now. With solar panels, I knew a little bit about them. Uh, being an architect, we've had some presentations in our office. I had heard about the 30% federal tax credit, and I knew there were some other state credits. But I still figured that we would have to pony up the rest of the of the expense. And from what I heard is that they cost somewhere over $20,000 to get a, a full system for your house. So we were really thinking that we would wait for our next house to make that investment and, and put up these solar panels. We had looked into it a bit, at least we had thought about it. My wife at one point had talked to somebody about it and had asked them to come out and give us a quote, but they never followed up, so we kind of dropped it. Last year, we were at a Mother's Day event uh, at Boston Common, which if you have young kids and you live in Boston, you should go down to the Common on Mother's Day. They do a what they call a duck parade, which is based on... Make way for ducklings. Yeah, exactly, which is based on make way for ducklings. I don't know, does anybody outside of Boston know what that is? <laughs> it's I, not, I, I think so. It's like this like classic kids book, but it's, it's all about Boston, so why would anybody else care about it? <laughs> yeah, well, I've got at least two Australian kids that know what it is. They're well-versed. If you're not familiar with it, it's a kid's book from like the 1940s about a family of ducklings that moves to Boston and the hilarious hijinks that ensue. So on Mother's Day in Boston, they have this duck parade down at the Boston Common where families go down with their young kids and the kids all dress up like ducks. They have like the Harvard marching band and all these other events going on. And it's, uh, if it's a nice day, it's just a nice excuse to get outside. <laughs> so we were down there uh, last year with our son. And there was a booth there for this solar company. My wife wanted to talk to them and, and set up an appointment to come to the house just to, again, just to kind of see what the deal was. So they came out a few weeks later. They do an initial assessment. So they came out and looked at the house. Um, and then they came inside. And <laughs> well, what we were hoping was that they would be able to give us the numbers or some numbers right there on the spot. They did give us about a two-hour sales pitch <laughs> about their company and what the whole process was going to be, which is fine. It was informative. But we didn't get the numbers then. They then go back and have their design team figure out the whole system and, and do the engineering um, and do the numbers on uh, what the payback could be. So about two weeks later, my wife calls me at the office and says, Tim, I think, I think someone broke into our house. <laughs> she, she came home and like our patio furniture is like strewn all over the place. And we had this little garden gate thing that we used to keep the dog in and that had been pulled out and put back in. And like, it looked like someone was just like ransacking our yard. <laughs> And uh, so then we figured out, we had totally forgotten about the solar thing at that point. And then, of course, we figured out that they had sent a contractor over to take some measurement, get up on the roof, take some measurements of the roof and everything. But <laughs> they hadn't told us about it, so we're like, what the hell? <laughs> so a few weeks after that, they come back. They had put the whole system together. Another kind of sales pitch, but this time they had the numbers. And it's kind of funny. The guy guy comes in with this like 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. And he, he takes another eight and a half by 11 and he covers up like half of the page so you can't see. Like he kind of builds it up like the reading of the <laughs> spreadsheet. <laughs> it's just dramatic. <laughs> it's a dramatic thing. But but it was good because he kind of, you know, you just look at it. You don't know what all the parts and pieces are without understanding 
how these systems work. Anyways, I'll have to remember that next time I'm trying to sell someone a 30 megawatt power station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as I had thought, the system for our well, first of all, it turns out that we have a pretty good roof for solar. We have a our roof face is a little bit southwest. It's a 45 degree roof. And generally, at least in the north, the steeper the angle, the better, because you want to take advantage of lower solar angles in the winter. You mean lower angles of insulation? I learned that word like yesterday, insulation. Yeah. It's like the angle that the sun hits the earth at or something like that. No, that's the alt- altitude. I, like, I worked in planetariums for eight years, mate. <laughs> what the altitude is. <laughs> now that, that would be the... Uh, the, the elevation, it's either the, the azimuth is the... Uh, it's left to right. It's, it's sort of the, the horizontal, yeah. Yeah, sort of sort of rotating horizontally, and then the elevation is looking up. Right. So the, let's just agree to call it the angle of incidence. How about that? I thought you said insolence. Insulation, insolation, S-O-L. Insolation, <laughs> insolence. That's, yeah, what <laughs> I think that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Indolence, I think that's what we're... Um, So the altitude, azimuth, insulation, were all very good for our house. For our house, we could get a a 3,825-watt system, which would provide 4,500 kilowatt hours per year. Our annual electricity use is somewhere, I think, just below 5,000, which means that this system essentially is going to cover 90% of our electricity use in our house. So does that take into account the actual incidence of like when you're using electricity as opposed to when it's being generated? The way that that works is, and it might be different with other in other states or with other electricity companies. So obviously you're going to have more solar energy production in the summer when there's more sun out and less in the winter. So the way that our company handles that on your bill. So first of all, this whole system is set up to backfeed into the grid. So we don't have a battery system or anything that's going to be storing the power within our house. We're still hooked up to the grid. We'll be generating power that gets put back onto the grid. They put a special meter on that essentially can run backwards so that when we get our electricity bill, it will show the amount of power we used and then subtract from that the amount of power we generated. So all we're paying each month is the difference between what we've used and what we've generated. So there will be some months, especially in the summer, where we're generating much more than we can use in any given month. They just carry those credits forward onto your next bill and the next bill after that, so that throughout the year, even if your production fluctuates, your costs are still going to even out and get you that, as I said, that 90% coverage from the solar panels on your electricity bill. That's pretty surprising, because normally, like, so I, so I work in power generation, and Normally, there's a pretty big spread between what you pay for electricity to import it and then what they would pay you to export it. So, you know, as a result, if you can use all the power that you're generating on site or in your house, then it's a lot better deal than if you're just generating power and exporting it to the grid. But I don't know, it sounds like you got a pretty good deal. I wonder if they might just be taking a, a risk on the spread between the peak and the off peak and essentially using that to compensate for what you'd normally see as the import to export spread. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think for these power companies, I mean, they they want people generating solar power, it's, as we'll get into a little bit later. There are a lot of incentives out there for them to actually be purchasing solar power off the grid from other generators. So I think for them, they just, you know, the, the simplest way to do the math is just to to kind of credit back the power that's used against the power that's generated. It might even be the state telling them that that's just how they have to manage it. All right, well, there's the first part of your scam, <laughs> if that's the case. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we'll get into that later, I guess. So one issue here is that if we end up, the way they do these, at least what they've told us, is that when they estimate our annual energy production, they're looking at it pretty conservatively because they don't want to come in and promise us this 4,500 kilowatt hours and then build this whole system and find out that it's underperforming. So so we think, and they think, that this is a pretty conservative estimate. So we could end up actually producing more energy than we use, or at least than we currently use in the course of a year on our house. In that case, they don't actually pay you back for the extra energy that you're generating. Uh, but what they let you do is you can donate or give as a gift any extra energy production to any other one of their customers. 
So in our case, we have we have a we're in a kind of small condominium where we have a separate electric meter for power at our, our garages and some of the common areas um, and, and other buildings on our property. So for us, that's kind of you know if, if we ended up producing more, I think we would just donate it donate it to the <laughs> condo to offset those other costs. Yeah, right. And then can you get like a tax deduction for that sort of donation, or is it just sort of does it just get credited to your account somehow? If you donated it to to a charity or something, I'm sure I think that you can. Um, yeah, right. It would probably have to be a, like a like a registered nonprofit or something like that. Yeah, I think so. You might be able to get some sort of tax deduction. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you could probably do that. Um, or you could just give it to a you know a friend, family, neighbor, or whatever. I mean, yeah. But the other thought there is, if we produce more, then you know maybe we start converting appliances over to over to electric appliance as opposed to we're currently on natural gas for our heat and hot water. Mm-hmm. Although, so we, we had had that thought, and while the guys are here in the process of installing the system, uh, my wife goes down to the basement the one day to to open up the bulkhead to let them in, and she's standing in a puddle of water in the basement. Our water heater had let go, and so we have, here we have like three electricians coming over, standing in a puddle of water, <laughs> you know, working on the electrical panels in like an eight foot by eight foot space. Jeez. And we're, we're all going around them with a shop vac, trying to mop up all the water and, Ugh. you know, on the phone with plumbers and trying to get somebody to come out that day. It's on a Friday before a three day weekend, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what about your sun? Don't you have a sump pump down there? Most of it got into the sump pump, but um, there, that side of the basement, the floor is all uneven. So there's still like, Still, kind of pools, puddles here and there that we had to uh, that we had to clean up. We've been expecting it, but um, we we're hoping that it would at least come after the panels were in, so that we could get a sense of of what the production would be. Because our thought was that we would replace our current gas water heater with an electric water heater, either instantaneous or or an electric tank water heater. So, <laughs> as my wife's on the phone with plumbers trying to convince somebody to come out here. I'm getting online and looking up all these, you know, <laughs> electric water heater systems and trying to figure out how much electricity they would use and is it worth it, you know, if, if we produce, you know, 10 or 20% more power than we currently use, would that cover the cost of, uh, or offset the cost of an electric water heater? And as it turns out, an electric water heater would actually use about as much production as we use for our whole house. Um, for for energy use, it would use about four four thousand kilowatt hours a year. Jeez. Um, if we want to do an electric water heater, so that was. You might be able to get something that's like a an electric gas hybrid, like instantaneous one or something like that. I don't know. They have. I mean, there's there are some other systems out there. There's like like heat pump type of systems and things like that. Yeah. But and I looked into a, a number of them and kind of did the math, but it didn't really make sense. The other problem we have is some of those systems are bigger. And we don't have a lot of height in our basement, so I'd go for. Uh, I recommend instantaneous. We had that at our previous house, and it was great. Yeah, we we thought about that, but those are more involved systems. And um, when you look at all the costs, like sometimes you have to like upsize your your gas line and stuff for for those type of systems. So mm, I uh, I doubt you'd have if, to do that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But well, at any rate, <laughs> nobody nobody would come, and we asked about it. Nobody yeah. would come and doing instantaneous that day i did this of yeah. course i did this whole spreadsheet looking at the payback and everything right. and it really just didn't didn't seem to be worth it for us so yep. at any rate we, so we just got like the dumb inefficient gas tank water heater again <laughs> so back to the sales pitch again this guy's got this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper he's covering it up with this other piece to, for this kind of dramatic revealing of our <laughs> of our costs and, and savings here the way that the pricing works for all of this uh, the total solar system installation was going to be, I'll just use round numbers, it was going to be about $27,000. The company gave us a discount for $1,800 for, I don't know what that was for. I think it was because we signed up. Like if we signed the contract that day, then they give us a pretty good pretty good discount. So I think that's what huh. that was. So after that discount, we're looking at about a, a $26,000 system. So then he starts going through the, the tax credits that you can get. And Massachusetts apparently has some of the best um, rebates or tax credits of any state in the country. So first of all, there's a federal tax credit for 30% of the total installation cost of the system. So in our case, that ended up being about $7,000. In Massachusetts, there's a state tax credit, uh, which is $1,000. And then there's also another Massachusetts rebate 
which is about twenty five hundred dollars. And I think that comes from probably the like the surcharge you pay on your electric bill for green power or whatever. Yeah. I think most states, you know, people have to pay an extra little amount every month to support green power. And some of that comes back to people like me who are putting solar panels on their house. And I think that's what this other, this $2,500 rebate uh, is funded by. Scam number two. Tip. So the total incentives, the total state and and federal incentives for the system are $10,500 right off the bat. So right there, the the cost of the system is now down to about $15,000. So then the other thing here is that over the next 10 years, we'll get these certificates called State Renewable... Renewable Energy Certificate. Solar right. Renewable Energy Certificates. Certificate. Yeah. At, uh, the, the abbreviation is SREX. Yeah. Is that like... In Australia, they've got some things that are just called RECs, Renewable Energy Certificates. Same kind of thing. Right. So what these are is power companies, their regulations, I don't know if they're federal or state or, or both that mandate how much green or renewable energy electricity producers need to produce. So for example, they might say, you need to have 30% of your electricity generation from renewable sources. So whether that's solar or wind, or I think most of it ends up being from hydroelectric. Now that the power companies don't have the capacity or don't have all the systems in place to generate that much energy for themselves. So the way that they claim credit for this 30% production is they purchase certificates. There's a market that the state has created for these certificates from solar and wind and and hydroelectric energy producers so that at the end of the year, if they don't have enough, or I guess month by month, if they don't have enough production from sustainable, renewable sources, they'll go out on the market and purchase these certificates from people like me who will, will be generating solar. So it's a little bit like a cap and trade kind of system, except it's not really a cap. It's sort of a uh, floor and trade, I guess. A quota, I guess. Instead of being a maximum, cap and trade is based on like maximum levels of emissions. Where this is sort of the opposite. It's sort of like a minimum yeah. level of generation from, from renewable energy. Right. And, and this is different from actually purchasing. They're not actually purchasing the power. They're just purchasing the right to say, we own this chunk of solar production you know, for, for the year or whatever it is. Again, it's just another um, way to fund <laughs> or to reimburse people producing solar um, as an incentive for, for them to do it in the first place. At the point of a gun on everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. So what this means for us is that for the next 10 years, we will get about $1,000 a year worth of these solar renewable energy credits, and that's based on your... The, the amount of your production, but for us, the math works out to be about a thousand bucks a year. Actually, it ends up being about eleven thousand dollars after the ten years. So now we have we take our fifteen thousand dollars system cost, subtract eleven thousand dollars. We're now down to about four thousand bucks for our out of pocket cost for this solar system. <laughs> so for four thousand bucks, we're getting a twenty seven thousand dollar solar panel system put on our house. Must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> The only issue here is that, as I said, that $11,000 of the SREC income comes over 10 years. And even the initial credits, the federal tax and state tax credits, you're not going to see those until your next year's tax return. So you would still need to put up the $25,000 out of your pocket initially. Um, So what this company we're working with does is they come and they offer you loans that are structured to be paid back within the time that you're getting paid back with all these credits. They give you one loan that's equal to the amount of tax credits you're gonna get back, which in this case was about $10,000. That's a zero interest loan for like 18 months. So essentially by the time the loan comes due and you need to pay it, um, you should have already gotten back your tax credits for the system installation. So that loan, that money really just, you never see it. They, They manage that all on their end. Money goes out, money comes back in, and you actually don't pay anything out of the pocket at that point. The second loan they give you is, and this is just this company in particular, they've kind of figured out this financing model. I think other companies have different models. But for us, the second loan was for the bulk of the remainder of the cost, which was the $15,000, which is a 12-year loan at like you know 3% or something, not much. It's basically like a car loan. And so we'll be making those monthly payments each month. But the way it works out is that between your electricity savings and the SREC income, which you're getting on an annual basis, 
you have more savings or income than what you're paying for the loan each month. So this thing ends up being cash flow positive from day one once they turn it on. And that's on an annual basis. So what that means for us is that rather than having like a 60 or 70 or $80 electrical bill each month, we're going to be saving or earning that of about $56 a month. That's something that's pretty important even with bigger power stations is the whole financing model and the commercial models that the different commercial models that you can use. They can really make the difference between whether or not a project gets off the ground or not. For example, if you're, let's say you're a gold miner out in remote Western Australia and you've got this deposit that you're looking to explore and develop. However, there's, there's a bit of risk involved in that you're not exactly sure how long the deposit will last. You know, will it, will it be five years before it's all mined out or 10 years? So you're a bit cautious as to laying down the, uh, the capital expense to build your own power station. But there's a whole raft of different companies that will come in and do what's called a build, own, operate where essentially this other company who specializes in power stations will come in and build the power station. They actually own the power station even though it's on your mine lease and they'll operate it throughout its life. And basically there's some agreement where you as the miner might sell diesel fuel or, or natural gas or something onto them and then they sell you power back over the fence. I think that with any power generation project where you have a significant outlay of capital expense at the beginning and then it takes a while before it really pays off. If someone's willing to come in and finance that for you, then it can really make your decision a lot easier. Yeah, and there are companies even around here that, so so what I just described, um, this is a system where we are purchasing and we will own the panels and the whole system when it's put in. Again, the only, the financing is done through loans, so we actually will own the panels, which we like. I, I prefer it that way. But there are systems out there that or there are companies out there that will do what Joe just described and well, they'll put the panels on your roof and then they own the panels, they own the power and the credits and everything, and then they just give you a reduced uh, electricity rate. So rather than buying your power from the electricity company, you're buying it from this solar panel company who owns the panels on your roof. And that becomes essentially like a lease uh, arrangement where they're getting their power at a fixed rate for the next 30 years or however long it is. So one thing I should mention is, you know, as I said, we are thinking at some point we will move out of this house, at which point we will we'll stop getting the electricity savings. So obviously that's going to affect the payback for the system. Um, however, we still would get the SREC credits even if we move. So if we move next year, that $11,000 of SREC money would still come to us no matter where we are. Uh, because that whole system is meant to be an incentive program for people to put the systems in in the first place. Not to mention that having the solar panels on your roof, I imagine, would increase the value of your house when you go to sell it. That's actually an important point that, that they made, uh, and they actually put it on this spreadsheet as, as part of the payback. They say, and there apparently there have been some studies done, that the value of your house increases by about 90% of your out-of-pocket installation costs for the system. So that's before the SREC credits. So so after the, the, the federal credits, as I said, our system, 25,000, 10,000 in credits, ends up being a $15,000 system. So they say that the value added to your house is about 90% of that cost. So it's something like 13,000 or $14,000 of home value that is being added in. So you can really factor that into the whole payback as well. So I had done this whole spreadsheet when we were considering this just to try to sort out the costs and make sure that they were really telling us kind of the full story on, the, on all the math that they had done. And yeah, I mean, it all, it all pretty much makes sense. The other thing I wanted to figure out is, is if we did move within like five years or so, would it still pay back? And it does. The real thing that, that helps with that is, again, is the value of the house. If you're looking at a, a $15,000 or $14,000 add to the value of your house, I mean, that offsets more than half of the cost of the system. And for us, that's that alone is much more than what we're putting in to the system. A couple other things just to consider here if you're doing the payback math. There are some maintenance costs. They say that the system is essentially maintenance free for the most part, but there are some components of the system that might need to be replaced over, they, they look at a 30 year lifespan of these things. And I think the panels are warranted for 30 years because they need really to guarantee that energy production for that amount of time to make it worthwhile for people. There are some other components. A big one is the inverter, which is the, the panels generate DC power. And so we have, at least in the US, I guess everybody has AC, don't they? Yeah, there's, there's 
yeah let's just say everybody has ac yeah <laughs> <laughs> um the panels generate dc power and so you need a way to convert that to ac power for your house and so we have this inverter box which is now in our basement that does just that an inverter box is sort of a glorified synthesizer where it just takes the flat dc signal and makes a sine wave signal out of it you know if you had a really cool casio keyboard or something like that and hooked it up to a sweet amplifier you could essentially build your own inverter box <laughs> <laughs> coming soon from an architecture products So anyway, so the inverter has, I think, a 10-year warranty, so it's possible that that might need to be replaced at some time during the life of this system. Another thing that they look at is they look at the condition of your roof. Um, Our roof had been redone right before we purchased the house in 2006, and generally a roof will last about, depends on the roof, but maybe 20, 25 years or so in New England. Not only that, but the solar panels actually protect the roof so that they help it to last longer. But at some point during the life of the system, we're probably going to need to replace our roofing, which means that they would need to take the panels down and put them back up. So all in all, the, those maintenance costs, it's about 2000 bucks to replace the inverter at some point and say another 2000 bucks to take the panels down and put them back up to replace the roof. So I factored, all, I factored those expenses into my whole spreadsheet as well. And again, it still ends up being a, a pretty sweet deal. So what all of this means for us is that if we look at a five-year payback, not including the value of the house, the cumulative savings or income that we have from this whole system is going to be about $3,700. When you add in that thirteen dollars or $14,000 of the home value, of course, that goes up to $17,000 after five years. If we go to 10 years, we're looking at $8,000 of the energy and tax credit savings, we're looking at $8,000 of electricity savings and SREC income. And again, with the home value, that adds up to about $22,000 of savings from this whole system. All right, and that those are all net figures after you've subtracted out all your actual costs for the system, right? Right. And financing and all that. Right, yep. Yeah. If we have this house and, and take it down to, to 30 years, which is the full life of the panel, it would be 40000 bucks worth of savings and income from this whole system. Including the home value, right? Right, including the home value, yeah. Yeah. And we're hoping, one thing we're thinking about, and I had kind of worked this out too, is that when we move from this house, we're hoping to keep it and rent it. And our thought there is that we could do one of two things. We could either include electricity in the cost of the rent and just charge a little bit higher rent to the tenants, or we could, well, I don't know, I guess we'd have to do it that way. I was going to say we could like charge them, like sell them electricity or charge them yeah, you know some amount for electricity, but I think that just that could get messy. <laughs> but the whole—I mean—the point being that you know we think that we can still get some some benefit from the electricity savings of this place um, even after we move out if we're renting it. All right, so that's all the numbers. So we go through this this whole thing, you know, the eight and a half by eleven. The guy gets to the bottom line, and I'm like totally sold. You know, <laughs> I'm like, where do I sign up? Let me, I'll take two of them. <laughs> Plus they were giving us a bonus like to sign up that day. And my wife says, well, you know, we never make decisions like this on the spot. We're gonna, let's, let's sit on it. Let's do the math on our end. This is before I did this whole spreadsheet, you know, and we'll, we'll come back and let you know. So we do that, you know, we get the numbers. In all the paperwork they had given us, there was a note there that said something about, so we have this tree on the side of our house. Um, that's actually, it's on the street, so it's city property. And they said that the tree would need to be trimmed back to the line at the eave in order for this thing to work. Now, of course, this is a problem because for one thing, it's a city tree, so we can't just assume that we're gonna be able to go out and trim it whenever we need to get it trimmed. Uh, The other thing is that, you know, if this thing is shading the panels that it could really cut down the production. The way these photovoltaics tend to work is that if they get a little bit of shade on them, they become a lot less efficient. And in the past, it's been the case that even if you get a little bit of shade on one of the panels or on one portion of the panels, um, the way that they're wired together, it actually brings down the production of the whole system. So if one panel is like 50% as efficient because of shading, I think it brings the whole the efficiency of the whole system down to maybe it's not 50%, but it, it brings it down quite a bit. Huh. Now what they've done is they have they have ways to manage that now. We have some little box <laughs> down in our basement now that's called an optimizer, which will essentially turn off or take out of the loop any panels that have shade on them or that have enough shade to be dragging the system down. 
So it seems like they've come up with a way to manage that. But at any rate, you still don't want shade on your system. I'm guessing that's because it the panel that has shade on it probably drops to a lower voltage or something like that. And then the other ones all have to right. match the same voltage. Otherwise, you're going to back feed into that panel and probably start a fire. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, so this is a city tree that they want us to cut down to the eave. And we, <laughs> you know, we had in talking about it, you know, we kind of think it's not a very, it's not like a real big tree. It's just, you know, one of these trees that they plant on the sidewalk or whatever. But you go out and look at it, and we took some pictures, and the tree is, is as tall as our whole house. So to cut that down to the eave, you'd be cutting off like a third at the top of the tree. So we took some pictures and sent it to them and said, look, this is, this is an ogo, you know, that the city's not going to cut this tree. Whenever they do come and cut the tree, they butcher the thing. <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't fallen over yet. And the funny thing about this tree is that it's not even supposed to be there. As I said, it's a city tree, but this little road next to our house it's just kind of a side alley. My neighbor actually uses it as his driveway. <laughs> and apparently what happened when it got planted, you know, 20 years ago, whenever it was, is that there's another street in the town that has a very similar name. And so I won't give the actual street names, but it's like rather than putting it on Cotler Street, they put it on Cotter Street or, you know, something like that. <laughs> and there's no sidewalk on the street. So the thing is literally just planted in the middle of the asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> next to our yard. <laughs> well, I was kind of wondered about that. Yeah, there's just that weird little dead end thing there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Apparently that's a story. So whenever they come and repave or whatever, we put like, you know, a big sign on the tree, like don't cut this tree down because it gives shade to our whole yard in the summer, like a whole patio <laughs> and everything. <laughs> so, uh, so we love the tree. We don't want it to get cut down. And so we went back to the solar guys and told them, you know, it's a no-go on this tree. We can't, we can't assume that the city's going to keep it trimmed for us. They sent somebody else back out to do some more measuring. They looked at the tree. They took a, I think they call it a solar camera or a sun camera, and put it up on the roof that essentially takes a 360-degree view from a couple of different points of the house, and it calculates the insulation. <laughs> it calculates the insulation, which is the, the, the amount of sunlight hitting the house throughout the year. And it turned out that there was really just one little corner of the house that would get most of the shade from the tree. And that corner was actually where we had some plumbing vent pipes coming up, so they couldn't put a panel there anyways. So it ends up that the system, when they, they came back the second time around, the system was going to be even more productive than what it was originally. They also figured out that they could add an extra panel in that they hadn't shown in the, in the previous array because of where some plumbing vents were. So we ended up with a better deal, or at least a better system. That's pretty good, like, because it's wintertime now, so that would be your worst case, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, the other thing with winter is that the leaves are off the trees, so you probably get a little better sunlight, at least filtering through the branches yeah. um, than you would in the summer from the tree. Yeah, but you got six feet of snow on top of your panels. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> well, the way it works, and it's funny, we, so we've gotten all the snow this year in Boston, like eight feet of snow or something ridiculous. They actually came up and installed the panels, like, in between a couple of the snowstorms that we had. They came a, a few times before the installation to shovel off our roof. <laughs> so we get like a foot of snow and then some poor, some poor schmuck shows up the next day to come up and put a ladder up and, uh, and shovel the roof off so Jeez. that they can come and do the panels later that week. So these guys are uh, Are they are using like intense. proper like safety harnesses and all that stuff while they're up there? Because I mean, that's they're like... They're basically roofers. They're, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're supposed to. They, you know, they had like a rope kind of strung up. I don't know where they had it strung up from, but... <laughs> Uh, man, I, I don't know. I watched the one guy go up. He was just like going up to check something. Yeah. And I watched him like scurrying around the roof. <laughs> he definitely was not tied in, at least the one time I saw him. He's just, I'm, I was standing on my garage actually shoveling roof off, uh, snow off my garage roof. Yeah. And I'm watching this guy just climbing all around Jeez. the roof. Because I mean, that's a pretty steep roof. You said what? It's like a 45 degree slope. Yeah, it is. It, it's steep. And he's just like walking around it like he's walking on the flat ground. Jeez. And middle of winter, it could be icy. Uh, yeah, totally. It's insane. Yeah, crazy. Jeez. Well, I think one day we'll do a show about uh, workplace safety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was not an example of it. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I think when they get up and they're actually working on the panels, they, they do tie in. This guy, he was just like going up to check something or turn something on. I don't know what he was doing. Yeah, that would make it hurt less when he smacked the ground. <laughs> well, honestly, if he fell, he probably would have been fine. There's all these videos that people have been putting up of people like jumping out of their second floor apartment windows into snow banks because <laughs> there's just so much snow <laughs> around true. here. Yeah. yeah. So to answer your question about snow on the panels, I've been watching it as we've been getting all these snowstorms. And generally, the snow that we've been getting has been pretty light. So a lot of it has just blown off the panels to begin with. 
we get a lot of wind on that side of our house, so that helps to keep them clear, I think, with all the snow. The other thing with the panels is that I think snow will tend to slide off of them more quickly than it will from certainly an asphalt shingle roof because the panels are a very smooth surface and as soon as a little bit of sun hits them I think they heat up enough to start to melt and lubricate the snow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I was wondering if you could like somehow back feed them and warm them up and <laughs> turn them into toasters to uh, melt the snow up there. <laughs> I don't yeah I don't know. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you'd, you'd think they might have a, uh, like you put heat tape on your roof so you don't get ice dams. Like yeah. Have something in there that they can heat up just enough to start to melt the snow and let it let it slide off. Mm. So after we signed up for everything, the next part of the process was that they needed to send people back out to do a more detailed evaluation of our house, which included looking at the roof structure up in the attic. Problem with our house is when we bought it, there was no access up into the attic, which is actually a code violation, but we let it slide in the inspection. I figured, you know, we would just come back at some point and, and cut a hole up in the attic and be done with it. What they did is when they refinished our house before we purchased it, they put new drywall over all the old horsehair plaster and wood lath. So each of our walls, when we've done a few renovation projects, and each of the walls is like you go through a layer of drywall wood furring strips, a layer of horsehair plaster, which is nasty stuff, uh, wood lath, which is horizontal thin pieces of wood on the wood studs, and then thick wood studs, and you have that on both sides of the wall. So we've taken down a couple of walls in our house and we had to go through all that. Um, but so it was the same thing up in the attic. They put new drywall just up on the ceiling over the old plaster ceiling up above. And in doing so, they just covered up the old access opening. We figured they were just being stupid about it, but as it turns out, the solar guys came over and they actually cut a new attic hatch for us and we picked out the hatch that we wanted to put up there and they ended up paying for it, which is great. So we got a free attic hatch out of this as well. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. It was like, it was worth like a couple hundred bucks at least. Oh yeah. It was, does it have like a ladder and all that stuff or is it just a hole? No, not a ladder, just a hatch and it's a, a piece of plywood. Uh, no, it's more than a piece of plywood. We got a pretty good, well insulated uh, mm. model the one I had looked up and found online. So yeah, yeah but they came out, had a contractor come out and install it. We were originally going to split the cost with them, but they screwed something up and then they offered to pay the whole cost. So, <laughs> or they didn't screw something up, but it was, it took a lot longer than it should have. So they cut the new hole up into the attic. The guys got up there to look around and lo and behold, apparently there had been a fire up in our attic at some point, <laughs> you know, years ago, <laughs> there was some evidence of fire damage up there in some of the roof joists. Jeez. It wasn't bad. It was just some surface kind of charring. Yeah. Um, but it, it looked like there had been. And it turns out, of course, there was an old hatch up to the attic, which is over our stairwell, and that was where the damage was. So hmm. could have been a fire in the house somewhere that the flames or the smoke got up through that hatch and had done some damage <laughs> up Jeez. in the attic. So like, okay, great. It seems the whole house is held up with a horse hair anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. It's like structural plaster. <laughs> so that was a problem. Obviously, the roof needs to be sturdy enough to support the panels and not not only structurally sturdy enough but the way building codes work is obviously they've gotten more restrictive over the years where nowadays if you build a house the structure has to be a lot more solid than if you did it probably even 20 30 40 years ago and our house the original structure was from 1905 huh. so the attic structure we had up there for the roof was two by five wood joists at 30 inches on center <laughs> with two inch planks over the top of them. If you were going to build a roof today with the span that we have, you could probably get away with like maybe two by 10 joists at 16 inches on center. <laughs> and so these were way under the current code requirements for how you would build a roof. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they are not structurally sound or that they can't support the load of the panels, but you know, somebody would have to do some engineering analysis to determine if those would be sufficient. I'd imagine that that steep angle on your roof might help a bit. You'd be distributing the weight a little bit better. The way they calculate roof spans in the building code, it's just based on the horizontal distance more so than the actual distance of the joists. I don't think it's an exact science, but I think there's a trade-off there where if you have a lower roof, you're going to have, you'll end up with an actual shorter span of the joist. Yeah, the, the steeper roof pitch helps where it can start to act more as a truss than as a single joist or beam element, especially if it's tied off with collar ties. The ceiling of our second floor is about a third of the way up on the joists, 
So that helps to tie the whole thing together a bit and, and make it act a little bit more like a truss. But it's still not sufficient. Yet with six feet of snow on the roof, somehow it still didn't cave in, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> Although, again, the, the snow for the most part was, was blowing off the roof. So. Yeah. so when we found this out that... You know, the roof structure was not substantial. Not only that, but it had had fire damage. In my mind, I was like, oh, well, this was this was an interesting little thought experiment, but mm-hmm. I guess that's the end of that. Mm-hmm. So they took the numbers back, and, you know, we had to wait a couple of weeks for the engineering or whatever. And then they sent us shop drawings for the whole system. They had drawn it all up, and they wanted us to prove the shop drawings were permitting. But the one piece was missing was this structural analysis. So we said, well, what's, what's the deal here? I mean, are they... <laughs> We're not, do we want to really want to go out and get this thing permitted if the roof can't support them? And so we sent some comments back on that, and of course the big question was the roof structure. So did you guys have to do the permitting process, or did they take care of that? No, they take care of all that. Okay. Again, we work with this company who was kind of like an intermediary yeah. for the actual installer. You know, they, they handle all the financing. They're almost like a maybe a project management, uh, maybe the equivalent on a construction project, yeah. where they just get everything set up. They deal with the installer and they manage the permitting and everything else yeah so after a couple more weeks they did get the structural report back to us and it was interesting the way that they put it was from a code standpoint the panels only weigh they're like less than three pounds per square foot on your roof and our roof only had one layer of shingles on it and the code allows you to re-shingle your roof without increasing the structural capacity of the existing structure without evaluating the structural capacity of the existing structure. Mm-hmm. And so they came in and said, well, to put solar panels on is actually less weight than if we were to reshingle the roof, and you're allowed to reshingle the roof, so <laughs> we should be allowed to put the solar panels on. Jeez. And this is coming from a structural engineer, and typically yeah. with building officials, you know, they'll accept a letter from a structural engineer. Does this guy have any sort of credentials? <laughs> yeah, no, he's a, he's a structural engineer, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's, you know, a guy on their staff or whatever who is actually an engineer. I'm an engineer. I, I can't do that stuff. Well, I learned how to do that stuff. I've forgotten it a long time ago. <laughs> oh, you don't work with a residential building code. <laughs> you know, I've seen things like that. Not quite that hokey. Yeah, but. it's fine. It'll go. No worries. <laughs> well, no, so this is the other thing. So he, they did do a bit of an analysis, and they said that we were going to need to add collar ties, which are just another set of cross beams or cross joists, I guess, mm-hmm. higher up in the attic. So now we would have the ceiling joists about a third of the span of the roof joists, and then we'd have collar ties at the top third yeah. or something like that. They had to be within I don't know, four feet of the top of the roof or something. But then with that, they approved the installation. So, so we were thrilled. We thought that this thing was dead in the water at that point. But after this structural analysis, they were ready to go. Hmm. So the next step of the process, I had mentioned that we had gotten some shop drawings to review. And what I mean by shop drawings is they send you drawings of how the whole system is going to be put together. So you get an electrical schematic, you get some details of how the panels are going to be fastened to the roof and things like that. You get specifications of what each of the pieces of equipment are. Now, this is, of course, part of my job is that I I often review shop drawings for all kinds of different things on, on our commercial projects. So so I went through and, and reviewed these in quite a bit of detail, probably more detail than most people <laughs> who get these drawings. I don't think most people are reading electrical schematics and, and marking them up for the, uh, the electrical engineers, <laughs> but I did. And plus my wife and I are pretty particular about where things get installed and located in our house. And so right. we wanted to be very clear about our expectations for where they would be putting everything. And plus there are some challenges just with getting things in and out of our bay from the, from the roof down to the basement, <laughs> again, without trying to go through these five layers of wall surface that we have in our house. Five layers of history. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I have found old newspapers and stuff in the walls. <laughs> funny. So one thing to think about there, again, if anybody listening is considering doing something like this, is just accommodating for all of the equipment. In our basement now, we have about a maybe six foot wide by three foot high piece of plywood, you know, plywood backboard that's now full of all these little boxes <laughs> that serve the system. There's a big one, which is the inverter. There's a, a couple of different types of, of shutdowns or contactors or breakers, other little parts and pieces. There's an optimizer box, which is something that, as I said earlier, can control which panels are turned on and off based on where the sun is hitting. And one cool thing about that is that they'll actually have that thing tied into the internet. And so we'll have some kind of, I don't know if it's an iPhone app or at least a website where we can go on 
And in real time, we can view the solar production of our house and we can check, you know, how much we've produced that month and what's going to be on our bill. So we get all that information in real time while these panels are up and running. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Is it like a smart meter sort of thing or is it? It will be. Yeah. I mean, the, the meter. So, yeah, then there are meters, of course, as part of all this, too. Yeah. Um, so there's a meter and a shutdown that go on the outside of the house. And those are the meters that tells how much power we're producing. We also have our, our electrical meter for the service coming in from the street which is actually currently in our basement, but they'll be changing that out to be a smart meter that can measure whether the power is coming from the grid or from our panels. So we approved the shop drawings, figured out where everything was going to go. They had someone come out to our house, and I walked through it with him just to, again, point out, we want this over here, that over there, get it all sorted out with him. So then once they got it permitted, they came in and did the installation. The first thing they had to do was to get up and put those collar ties up in the roof, so they came out and did that on one day. The next day they came out and put the panels up on the roof, as well as put some of the electrical equipment in the basement. And then the third day they came up and, I guess, wired everything up. And that was pretty much it. They still have a couple little things they need to do. There's one thing they need to turn on or something. And the electrical company comes out separately to put their meters in. So that's something we're waiting for at this point. How do they get the panels up onto the roof? Do, do they use some sort of a crane or hoist or just chuck them on their backs up the ladder? <laughs> you know, I didn't watch them actually bring them up, but I mean, they were just, these, the panels are pretty light. Yeah. I saw them just kind of walking around. I know I watched them walking by. I was <laughs> working from home one day while they were here because I didn't want them to be around while they were doing the work. And uh, I was just watching them go back and forth, you know, in front of my house with the panels, just walking them over. I don't know if they were actually rigging them up and lifting them up or if they were literally just climbing up the ladder <laughs> with a panel in hand. A thing in one hand. Yeah. I don't know what Jeez. Yeah. I don't know which is safer because you don't necessarily want these things blowing around if you're, you know, lifting them up on a piece of rope. Yeah, but you could you could go up the ladder and keep a hand on it, like you know, take the load off of you while you're climbing the damn ladder. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they yeah, they must have done something. Yeah. yeah. I used to hang speakers and stuff and as long as you don't stand under it, you know, you're pretty well safe. <laughs> right. But yeah, so within three days, they had this whole system installed. How was it attached to the roof? Is there some sort of unistrat or something like that up there? Well, to attach to the roof itself, they have these clips that have like a, a six or eight inch piece of, of metal flashing attached to them. So they slip the flashing under your roof shingles yeah. and then they screw it down to the joist underneath. And they do have to get it on the joist, so I'm not sure how they actually found the joist. Hopefully they didn't. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't do what, what I've often seen guys do in the field, which is drill three screws until one of them hits a stud and <laughs> lock it down. <laughs> Hopefully that a more scientific way of, of locating the studs. Yeah. So, so there's no like metal base frame underneath these things or anything like that? Yeah, so then these clips, then they have rails that run left to right on the roof yeah. that then the panels pop onto. So that all finished a couple of weeks ago, and then we just had our electrical inspection earlier this week. And so now we're just waiting for the electrical company to come out and put their meter in. Then it should be up and running. Good stuff. You're saving the planet. <laughs> Damn straight. Okay, so there's a few reasons why we're calling this Tim Solar Scam. During the previous nuts and bolts discussion, we raised a few points where there were certain government subsidies and that sort of thing, uh, which I callously called scams. Now, I guess before I go much further, I should qualify that I, I do work as an engineer building power stations. Now, my main focus is on gas-fired and diesel-fired power stations. So there's probably a lot of people out there that'll say that I've got some sort of vested interest and, you know, that I'm just trying to knock solar just to save my own skin. Like, I think I'm pretty comfortable stating that I don't really think that solar is that much of a threat to gas-fired and diesel-fired power stations. And at the same time, I do think it is a, a good technology and a very promising technology for a future of greater energy abundance and more decentralized energy generation. Well, I might sound a bit negative about some stuff here. To some extent, I'm just playing devil's advocate just to have some interesting conversation. But at the same time, I do have some apprehensions, I guess, about some of the ways that solar power gets promoted these days. If you've listened to the first three episodes of this podcast, God help you, <laughs> you'll have a pretty good understanding of our perspective on things and where we're coming from. So we'd like to break this down a little bit and take a look at it from an anarchic perspective and try to understand whether or not overall this is a good thing or a bad thing that there's these programs out there to promote this sort of technology. As we discussed in the previous episodes, one of the fundamental problems with government 
is that almost all government funding comes from taxation or from some other initiation of force. And again, we're calling taxation an initiation of force because if you don't pay your taxes, eventually that could lead to government agents arresting you, restraining you, putting you in jail, or worse. And of course, all of those are types of initiation of force. So if we're discussing a society in which the initiation of force is not seen to be legitimate, then programs like these solar promotions, which are using money taken from people by force and given to specific individuals, in this case, for the purpose of purchasing and installing solar panels, that's something that's not happening on an anarchic, nonviolent basis. At this point, it appears to only be happening because of government force. Beyond the issue of taxation and redistribution, which we'll probably get back to in a little bit, there are a couple of other ways in which force is being initiated here in order to bring about this outcome of more solar panels on people's roofs. One which we mentioned previously is that there's some sort of quotas or, or minimum amounts of renewable energy that power generators are required to produce. So while you may or may not think that it's a good thing that power companies are producing more green energy, the bottom line is there is someone with a gun there, figuratively at least, telling them how much green energy they should be producing, whether or not it's in the company's best interest to do so. Or their customer's best interest. Right. And another much more subtle initiation of force is the manipulation of bank interest rates, which is primarily driven by the policies of the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, we're not going to really get all into that here. It's probably one of the less significant factors here, because it's likely that even with higher interest rates, this would still be a reasonably good deal for Tim. So with the issue of the taxation and the federal grants, first of all, is it in the form of a grant or a tax credit? Is it like a rebate that they send you a check or is it just a credit? The federal one is a tax credit. Right. And then the state one is a tax credit as well. And then there's a separate state rebate. That's, I think, a check that we get back. Right. So there are probably a lot of maybe anarchist type or even conservative type people who would who might argue that a tax credit is actually a good thing because what that means is that you're actually not being required to pay more taxes to the government. So th there's probably some sort of argument that people might make there to say, well, you know, this, is, this isn't actually some sort of taxation and redistribution scheme. It's actually just a reduction of taxes. So, you know, that, that can't be bad. And there's a certain point to which that's true, I guess. Although I don't, I don't see that it really makes a difference one way or the other if it's coming out of the general pool of taxes or if it's just less money that Tim pays into the general pool. It's not like individual people's taxes are allocated to one purpose or another. Once it goes into the government trough, then uh, people like Tim can come and grab it out. The problem is not so much the method by which it gets funded. It's the effect that that funding has on the market for these solar panels and for electrical power in general. Obviously, if people can purchase and install these systems essentially for free, there's really no market pricing that allows supply to meet demand for these types of systems. Now, of course, that's the whole point, is that they want to create this, let's say, artificial demand, or at least demand at a much higher price than where it might exist in absence of these types of incentives. And that's done presumably to promote development of the industry and further technological development and investment in R&D for these panels. Well, and just to get more capacity of these panels up on the grid. Right. Reduce our dependence on Joe's dinosaur-sucking power <laughs> stations. We use biogas too, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're using biogas. And the requirement on generators to produce a certain amount of green power creates similar distortions in the market, where you've got essentially excess supply of green power, but maybe not necessarily the demand there for it, at least the voluntary demand there for it. And so what happens is that the power companies end up increasing the rates on their customers which they can do across the board because all of their competitors have to do the same thing. They all have this new cost, assuming that the green power is more expensive than conventional power generation. They know that all their competitors have this additional cost as well, so they know that they can raise rates without having to worry about their customers going to some competitor. Not only that, but these SREC credits, which is what they're purchasing, at least in Massachusetts, the price of the SRECs are fixed by the state. So... Basically, once a year, the state comes in and they clear the market at a certain price of these SREC credits. So that's how we know that we're going to get the value of these SREC credits over the next 10 years, that the state has actually prescribed what those rates will be, you know, in July of each year from now through whenever. 
which means that the power companies also know how much these credits are going to be so that they can all work those into their costs in the same way. Right. So essentially you have electricity customers paying now for green energy that'll be generated up to 10 years out from now. I could see this sort of thing being done without the quotas and stuff. You could imagine some sort of a speculative market in green energy futures or whatever, you know, solar futures, if there was a genuine demand from people to buy green energy instead of coal-fired energy or whatever. I don't think that's really an unreasonable assumption to make. In Australia, at least, when you go to sign up for your power plan, you can choose a green energy package and you pay a little bit more, but you get some sort of guarantee that, you know, 10% or whatever of your power generation comes from green sources or supposed green sources. Yeah, we I've had that too. Uh, I don't think our current company, I think they recently started to offer some of those different options. I think for a while in Massachusetts, at least where I live, there was really only one game in town. You could only buy power generation through your electrical company. And they recently, I think, opened that up so that you can shop around for different, I think at least different generators. I'm still paying my company for the transmission costs, but I'm paying someone else through them for the generation. I think the way some of that works when they do that deregulation is you might have some company that comes in and essentially buys up a block of, say, kilowatt hours in a year. Or they come to some agreement with the generator where they say, okay, well, look, we'll guarantee you that we can buy this much power over the next six months or something, or over the next 12 months. And then the, they'll negotiate a better rate with the existing power company or, or the generators and the transmission lines and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So then they're the ones who can go kind of house to house and sell these discounted energy packages hmm. because they've been able to kind of negotiate this wholesale rate. Again, with, with the electricity industry, there's no end of different kind of commercial models that people can come up with. So you can imagine that in more of an anarchic system, Rather than having the government require power companies to produce or to purchase a certain amount of green power production, that a market price could be established for the premium, if there is a premium for that green power production, that would allow the supply of green power to be matched to the demand for green power by people who really care about it. And shouldn't we all care about it? Well, I'll tell you why I don't care about it, <laughs> or at least why I've become embittered about it. Twist. <laughs> So in Australia here, over the last few years, we've had a number of various government-promoted green energy schemes, probably the most famous of which was the carbon tax, which came in a couple of years ago, and it was actually repealed before it actually came into effect. <laughs> we can get to that a little bit later. That's a whole uh, can of worms in itself. However, there, there are more local plans that have happened as well. So at least from my experience in Adelaide in South Australia, they had a, a similar kind of promotion to the sort of thing Tim's getting but it was based on a feed-in tariff. And what that is, is essentially it's just a higher kilowatt hour rate that they'll pay you for the power that you export to the grid. So where I was talking before about how there's normally a spread between the amount that you pay to import power and the amount that they pay you to export power, which normally you lose money if you're exporting in comparison to how much you buy when you import. With this feed-in tariff, it went the other way. So they're paying you more money to export power then people on the other end are paying to import the power that you're generating. Let me just restate that again to see if it makes sense to anybody. So Tim would get paid 50 cents per kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour that he exports to the grid. And the guy across the street from him who's using the power that Tim's generating is paying 35 cents a kilowatt hour for that. Where does that other money come from? There's 15 cents per kilowatt hour missing there. So where's that coming from? Obviously, as we've discussed before, it had a similar effect of pushing up power bills. In fact, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. I was looking at my own power bills over the last five years or so, and they've actually doubled over the last five years. Now, part of that is probably consumption because we've had, since the beginning of that chart, we've had two kids, and so we're probably using a lot more washing machine and dishwashers and all that stuff, as you tend to do. However, there has been significant increases in the rates and all the um, transmission fees and all that kind of stuff. And now in, in South Australia, there are other issues with the poor management of the infrastructure, and there's a lot of investment that has to happen to, to maintain that infrastructure that some of that cost is related to kind of the upkeep of the grid. However, there, there certainly has been a significant increase in power prices as a result of this feed-in tariff scheme. So for people who support solar, you know, they might not think that's such a bad thing, that it's raising the cost of power so that hopefully people use less, start to conserve more. 
which means that they're conserving on fossil fuel generated power as well as the solar power that's now coming online. But the thing to remember here is that this is affecting everybody equally. It's not like a progressive income tax where more wealthy people are paying more than less wealthy people. When your electric bills go up, everybody's electric bill goes up. So this is something that's disproportionately taxing poorer people as a percentage of their overall income. And in practice, it's actually more of a regressive tax because what's happening is that everyone needs to use electricity. But people who are only renting or who don't own a house or who don't have enough of a good credit history or cash in the bank to invest in these solar panels, they're the ones who are footing the bills of this feed-in tariff. So what's happening is that you've got what are more likely the poorer people in the society subsidizing this perk for the really the richest people in society. The people who have the most roof space can benefit the most from this thing. And I don't know if there are any cutoffs or anything like that. And like I don't know the details of the scheme enough, but... Myself, as someone who has rented over the last few years and who previously lived in a house uh, where there were just too many trees to, <laughs> to to even think about doing solar, I've become a little bit embittered about the whole thing. And it has nothing to do with the technology. Again, I think solar power is great. If the technology improves, if the costs can come down, I'm all for it. And I think this is something that really makes these green energy debates so divisive is that you've got one side of people who want to promote green energy at any cost. For good reason, because they're forward thinking and they want less pollution, they want more abundance of energy, they want more decentralized power. And look, I agree, these are all good things. However, the fact that they're willing to do it at any cost and to use state power to achieve that end, this gets back to the chart that we discussed of means and ends. So I agree with the ends of people who promote green power. However, what I disagree with is the means of using the state to achieve that end. And the problem with that, as Joe just touched on, is that when you have people who are opposed generally, or at least on some level, to state power or overreach of the state, then if you're using the state to promote green power, now you start to make those people enemies of green power because right. they start looking for ways to, as Joe said, kind of disprove or fight this end of promoting green power in addition to opposing the means of, of using government force. So a more anarchic approach for people who are supporters of green power, of course, would be some of the things we've talked about, like allowing people to purchase green power generation, and that might be at a higher price. Eventually, that might be at a lower price as more capacity comes online. You can have nonprofits who can invest and create the same kind of incentives that are currently being provided by the government. It's unlikely that they might be able to give everybody $10,000 to put a system on their roof. Or maybe it isn't. Maybe there are enough people who have strong enough support for solar power that they would be able to raise enough money and come up with models where they can fund people's solar installations. Or even if they're not giving them the money outright, then maybe they can come up with these, as Joe said, some of these creative financing models that make it worthwhile for people to install more of these systems. And so if these were the approaches that proponents of green power were taking, rather than running to the government for subsidies, I think you'd have a much less antagonistic debate about whether or not we should be promoting or supporting or funding green power. Right, and you could focus more on just the technical merits of it alone. Another distortion that's caused by government promoting these systems is that it it's kind of like the cash for clunkers things, where what happens is that it brings forward demand so that everyone jumps in and buys solar right now, and then you know they've got their solar panels, they're set for the next, what is it, 30 years, the lifespan of those things? Right. And what I wonder is how much is solar panel technology going to improve even in the next five years? And everyone's going to have these kind of old, beat up, today's technology solar panels on the roof where you know, maybe in another couple of years, they could be twice as efficient, or they could be half the cost, and the people would have that money to spend on other things like you know, a wind turbine or something. You know, or God forbid, something they want to buy for themselves, or, or even worse, save it. Good God. Or an electric water heater. <laughs> yeah, an electric water heater. And of course, this is a pretty speculative claim. I don't know what the physical limitations are of solar panels and, and how, uh, how efficient they are these days compared to what's sort of the optimal efficiency that they could achieve. I know that there are some pretty wild technologies that are in development using different types of materials that could maybe capture a, a wider range of the frequencies that are emitted by the sun. However, I don't really know enough about that stuff to make any real claims there. But the point is, it's a distortion in the market. And one way that this gets manifested is that solar is an example of the type of project that has a high upfront capital cost, but low ongoing operating cost. So there's really not a whole lot of maintenance that you have to do. 
So what it means is that when you've got these schemes that promote people jumping in and buying these things early on, then it means that they're deferring future economic consumption in order to make this investment today. Now again, whether or not this really has any negative effects is it's probably dependent on every individual situation and a number of other factors. So there's a supply side effect of this government incentivization as well. In Adelaide, when they brought in all these government tariffs and rebates and all this stuff, what happened was all of a sudden every single tradesman, you know, maybe a roofer might make sense, but you had guys like gutter repairers, sheet rockers, painters, guys that would lay tile and that kind of stuff. All of a sudden every single like tradesman in Adelaide <laughs> is selling solar panels and they're all offering these finance schemes and everything else, you know. <laughs> yeah. So Yeah. How many of those guys do you think are qualified to uh, install those systems? They probably subcontract stuff out to electricians or whatever, you know. I mean, this Yeah. Australia has no lack of regulations for all that kind of stuff. Right. So you certainly have to have some sort of licensed electrician installing it and it's just kind of weird, you know. You had guys offering um buy some solar panels and you get like, you know, 10 free cups of coffee at some coffee shop or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's like just ridiculous stuff. You know, and so what happens is you get a this saturated market where where the people who are selling these things can't turn a real profit on it. They're basically just chasing these subsidies, chasing the rebates and everything, trying to grab some of this business. But everybody's doing it. So there's not really any sustainable businesses that are being developed around this sort of technology and these kind of solutions. Hmm, At least that's right. my impression of it from all these ads yeah. you see on TV. It's like, you know, how is this gutter repairer guy all of a sudden going to be a solar panel expert? And like, give me a break. He's just importing some cheap crap from China and slapping it up on your roof, you know, and grabbing his rebate or subsidy or whatever it is. Yeah, right. Well, and there could, I mean, I guess to my point about the quality of the installation, I would think that in that situation, you probably get a kind of a race to the bottom with these guys where, yeah, they're just fine. And rather than really getting to know the panel manufacturers and trying to give their customers the best system, like you said, they're just trying to get the cheapest panel they can find and put it up as quickly as they can on someone's house and, and flip the switch. Yeah, they just want to make the sale. The rebates are the same no matter what, what the quality of your system is. So Right. My impression from kind of watching the whole thing develop, and of course, as I mentioned before, I was in a position where I was never going to install solar panels in my house because at the time that these incentives were introduced I did own a house but I was living up in the hills and we had a lot of trees around the house we just didn't get enough sunlight on our roof to really make it worthwhile right after that I was always renting so you know I wasn't going to put solar panels up in some house that I'm renting right <laughs> which kind of comes back to the whole the whole issue of the poor subsidizing the rich not that I'm necessarily poor but you know people tend to think of people who rent as being <laughs> less less better off than the people who they're renting from and so essentially you get this kind of subsidy from the poor to the rich. I feel poor. Living in Australia, you feel much poorer than I did living in America, <laughs> even though I'm making, probably yeah. making more, you know, nominally making more money here. Everything is like <laughs> double the cost that it is in, in the U.S. <laughs> right. Except for solar panels. So what if there weren't all these government incentives for solar panels? How feasible would it be for people to be putting solar panels up on their houses? And what would the payback be for people who are doing that? Uh, so as I said, I had done this whole spreadsheet up looking at the cost for our situation. I've gone back through that and taken out the governmental incentives to see what the actual payback from these panels would be if somebody just bought them outright. So as I had said, in my situation, we got about $10,500 worth of federal and state incentives to fund the installation of our panels. So what would the payback be on that just in our electricity savings alone? Well, I shouldn't say that. I want to look at two things here. It's the electricity savings as well as the increase in the home value, which as we said in this case, uh, we've been told, and I've, you know, I think it makes sense, that the increase in the home value is probably about $14,000 on day one. So with just the electricity savings without the increase in home value, the system would pay for itself after 22 years. So when you hear people talk about how current technology and solar panels don't pay for themselves, I mean, that's the number they're looking at is that 22 years out that these things actually recover your electricity costs. And remember, it's only a 30-year panel. So, you know, at the end of the day, after the full life of the panel, you're not really making that much money. But when you add in the increase in the home value, which, as I said, is probably about 14000 bucks, this thing breaks even after 10 years. And then from there, you're earning a little over $1,000 a year. So that's not an entirely unreasonable payback for somebody to invest in as an investment on their home if they're going to be there for some amount of time. 
in commercial or industrial projects, normally they're looking at a payback of something like two to three years. If you can get two to three years payback on something, you're doing pretty good. It's a pretty compelling case. If it's more like five years, you're going to have a little bit of a struggle trying to get that project across the line. And that's just because they've got other projects, not necessarily energy projects, but other projects, if it's, let's say, it's a manufacturing plant, they might have some other process within their manufacturing plant that they can invest that money in to upgrade to get some better returns. And now, of course, those might not be necessarily energy returns, but they would be some sort of financial savings in their process. Yeah, I've heard just, we've had similar conversations on some projects I've been involved with about the payback time. And for these types of technologies, at least for building plant improvements, the types of paybacks that our engineers often look at are maybe something like five to seven years. Yeah, it does depend a little bit on what the total lifespan of the project is. So if I'm looking at a gold mine that's going to be operational for five years, obviously a seven-year payback isn't going to mean much to those guys. But if you're looking at something like a car manufacturing plant, which is going to be operational for 25 years, then a seven to 10-year payback might make a little bit more sense. Right. And my firm works a lot with institutional clients like hospitals and universities. And those institutions tend to think very long term in their planning. So something like a like a five or seven year payback it could mean a lot to those guys. But as I said, we're not quite there with the 10 year payback on these solar panels. However, that's with no financing. As we talked about earlier, there are often ways to finance these projects that improve those paybacks or at least make them more affordable. So if we look at the same spreadsheet with the same loan that I get, and I know that you most likely wouldn't get the same loan package without the guaranteed paybacks. But look, it's not a lot of money here, as I said. It's, so the value of our system was about 25000 So to take out a $25,000 loan, that's essentially like a car loan, you could probably collateralize your house with it or at least just collateralize the solar panels. I'm sure that somebody could come up with some kind of a model where that all works. The numbers I worked out here assume that you're paying back that initial $10,000 loan in the first year because that's the one that, in our current situation, is paid back from the credits that we get from the federal government. In this case, with the financing, again, there's still a 22-year payback on the electricity savings. That's probably extended a little bit because now you're paying some interest on the loan. But again, if you add in the home value, if you pay off that $10,000 loan in the first year, you've added $14,000 of home value. So in the first year, you're really up $4,000 in terms of equity or your net gain from the project. Over the next 10 years or so, those numbers start to tick down as you're paying off these loans. But then after a year, in this case, it's a 12-year loan, after year 12, when you pay that loan off, you're still positive. The cumulative numbers go, let's say in year one, it's 4,000 from the uh, home increase, as I said. Those start to tick down so that at year 12, when you pay off the loan, you're at $560 uh, to the good. So you're still positive, but, but just barely. And then after that, it starts to tick back up again. So it goes up the next year to about $2,000. And, oh, you know, the numbers jump around here a little bit because I included some maintenance costs, like replacing the inverter, replacing the roofing. So, uh, But essentially, the numbers start to then go up about 1500 bucks a year moving forward. So that after 20 years, you're up to about $9,000 of positive cash flow on the project. So I think what this shows is that it is possible to come up with models to make these type of solar panel installations cost effective from day one for people who are really interested in, in solar and who are planning to stay wherever they are for some period of time. And I know that most people don't stay in their house for 20 years, but you know maybe there could be a way to essentially transfer the loan on these systems to the new owners. Maybe at that point, something like a leasing model starts to make more sense for these residential installations where the new person, you know, if you sell your house after five years or 10 years, then the new person who comes in and buys your house, rather than you having to keep paying this loan for something that you've already sold. I'm sure there could be models out there where people finance these things in a way that it provides enough incentive for people to install the systems in the first place and know that they're going to be getting a reasonable payback. I guess the main thing is whether those energy savings are more important to that person than some other investment that they might use that money for, be that something on their house or anything else, even a you know stock market investment or bonds or something like that. Right. It comes back to the whole point about you know matching the demand to the supply. So you'd have people who are really interested in this technology and who believe that solar power is a good thing for society, for the planet, whatever. I think there are ways to make these systems affordable for those people without all these federal incentives that create so much market distortion. And this is the way that most new technologies get adopted by the general public. 
If you look at something like a Tesla car, they started out with a super high-end race car where only you know, the super rich could afford it, but now they're starting to release something to compete with a Toyota Corolla or something like that. They're probably still on the expensive side, but they are starting to look at more of a mass consumer kind of middle class market and try to make the technology work there. Now, some people might look at this and call it some sort of trickle down economics or something like this, where, you know, the rich get this stuff first or whatever. But what I think it is, is that the people who want it the most and who can afford it are the ones who get it first. And yeah, of course, some of them are rich, but, you know, there could be someone who's just gung ho on, I'm going to have a solar house. Maybe they build their own house out in the woods or something like that, and they stick solar panels on it. And that's what they're all about. So they save money on everything else. You know, they, they cut back on everything else just so they can afford those solar panels so that they can do that. When you've got markets setting prices for things, then it's up to the people to decide what they want to spend their money on, as opposed to the government trying to push people in a certain direction as to how they're going to spend their money or whether or not they should spend their money at all as opposed to just saving it. So any sort of new energy technology, especially a mass market power generation technology, introduces some technical challenges because of the way that the electricity grid works. We talked earlier about AC versus DC power, where if you remember AC power has this sort of waveform shape where the, the voltage goes up and down and up and down. What this waveform comes from is mechanical generators spinning around at a certain rotational speed and the frequency that you get on the grid is a multiple or a factor of the speed that these things are spinning at. So for example in Australia the power frequency is 50 Hertz and generators spin at 1500 RPM. There's a way you can divide that out to work out that they basically comes up to 50 hertz. So in the US, the grid is at 60 hertz, and so the generators there spin a little bit faster. And so what happens with these solar panels is that we talked before about how there's this device called an inverter, which takes the DC signal, which is just a flat voltage coming off the solar panel, and converts it into a waveform to match the waveform that's on the grid. So one challenge that these inverters and solar systems have to meet is making sure that they always sync to the grid properly. Because I think I might have mentioned before, if you don't sync correctly, if, if you're out of phase with the waveform that the grid is operating at, then it turns your device from a generator into either a motor or a toaster. I think in the solar panels case, it would be <laughs> more like a toaster. Right. So, you know, if you got snow on your roof, it's not a bad thing, but it might only take a couple of seconds <laughs> to melt that snow once, the, once those things heat up. It's amazing how quickly stuff heats up with these power systems when things don't go right and how quickly things can burn out and cause all kinds of problems. Just to give you a better understanding about how this works, these days everything's automated and you know, you've know you got all these digital devices that monitor the waveform of the grid and then they close your breaker at just the right time and, and everything's synchronized. You know, they control the speed of your generators and all that stuff. And I'm sure that inverters have all that sort of technology built into them. But uh, back in like the 60s and 70s, before they had all these computers and microprocessors and all this stuff, everything was done with relays and blinking lights and all this stuff. So what would happen is that in order to sync your generator onto the grid, you'd have these like three blinking lights and you'd have to just watch them until all three lights blinked at the same time. And then all you could do there is when you think you got it right, you close the breaker and pray to your gods because you, no <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea if you've got it or not. <laughs> so what happens if you miss it then? What, it just it like blows up your system or it just yeah, trips your breaker, I guess? Yeah, probably. <laughs> it depends on how good the uh, protection is, I guess. But um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a good chance that you could cause some very expensive damage <laughs> to a big generator. So what are you saying? So with, with solar panels, you're saying that if everybody had these solar panels, that that becomes a problem with synchronizing the grid? When you synchronize to the grid, it's kind of like the biggest generator is the one that sets the speed for everybody else, more or less. So every new generator or load that you add onto the grid, suddenly the, uh, you know, let's say you've got a, a generator putting out 10 megawatts and that's your whole grid. Now this obviously is a, a very, very small grid, something you might have for like a, a single mine or something like that. If you've got that and you add on another two megawatt motor or a, a two megawatt load, then all of a sudden what will happen is it's almost as if you're kind of riding, a, riding like an exercise bike and all of a sudden it switches the program to like the harder level and you know all of a sudden you've got to pedal a lot harder so what happens is that it kind of affects everything <laughs> you've got voltage dips you've got frequency dips or voltage spikes frequency dips and all this stuff that happens and then it takes the generators a, a few seconds to sort of get back into sync with each other so what happens is, is as you add large loads or uh, or large generation capacity because the same thing happens if you turn on a new generator as well and you bring these things onto the grid then it affects the performance of the grid as a whole. 
Now, the way it works these days is that you've got these massive generators running on either coal-fired generators or natural gas or something like that. They're generating hundreds of megawatts for a given city. Plus, they're all connected to this national grid, which shares loads and generation capacity between different cities. So when you put your dinky little, what is it, three kilowatt? Uh, yeah, I think it's like three kilowatts, yeah. All right, so when you put your three kilowatt load onto this couple of gigawatt grid, it's not going to blink. It doesn't really affect anything. So all you're doing is kind of looking at, okay, what's the frequency? Okay, I'm going to match that. There I am. I'm a little bit curious as to what happens if, let's say if more than 50% of the grid is all these people with solar panels on the roofs generating power. Uh -huh. And then they're the ones essentially who are setting the grid frequency. Now, there are things that they can do where there's, they do sort of like a sync signal, which might come over or a separate line, like over the internet or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you could have everyone syncing to the same signal. But one problem with that, and, and again, look, I'm, I'm not really an expert on this side of things, but I'm, I'm just kind of speculating a little bit. I'm guessing that smarter people than me have figured out ways around this. But just to give you a better understanding of how this all works, every load that's connected to the grid for one thing, it, of course, draws current from the grid, which means it's essentially sucking in electrons. But another thing that it does is it can do what's called a phase shift, where it takes that waveform and either shifts it kind of to the left or to the right. Essentially, it could introduce a delay into that voltage signal. The different loads on different areas of the grid affect the waveform so that you don't have everyone operating exactly in sync with each other. So your inverter on your roof might be doing something completely different than the inverter on someone else's roof across town. And that's caused by all the local loads and properties of the transmission cables and transformers and all that stuff that's in between them that affects the way that those waveforms come through. So there's not just one waveform for the whole grid. It, that waveform is different depending on where you are in the grid. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So really you need to be looking at what's the waveform on the grid right now and I'm going to sync to that. I really don't think it would be a huge problem if you got a lot of people generating using solar. You know, Let's say the whole grid was being generated by people with solar panels on the roofs. Where you would find the biggest problem is if let's say there was a blackout in the middle of a sunny day and then all of a sudden the fault was resolved and everyone flipped on their solar panels at the same time. Well, obviously that's going to have a huge effect on what the grid's doing at that point. And it'll probably be a bit chaotic to try to get all those you know, thousands of solar panels to sync up with each other. Huh. However, what they could do, and this is something that they do even on normal grids, is they do sort of a sequential startup where they'll start up. You might be the first one to start up and then your neighbor's houses syncs to you and then the next guy syncs to both of you and so on. Hmm. That way you kind of start from one signal and then everyone else syncs onto that. I would guess that that would be, I don't know if it is now, but you'd think that that could all be automated so that, or at least that that's under the control of the power company so that they, you know, can send a signal to my system to start it up whenever. Yeah, that's right. They've got three blinking lights for every person who's got solar panels. <laughs> they got a guy, a guy <laughs> sitting right. in the control room somewhere going, okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess you get really good at it. <laughs> yeah, no, but you're right. I mean, that, that stuff is all automated these days. And even when they do it on remote power stations for a mine site or something like that, that's basically how it works. It's just that I guess that happens when they've got maybe 10 small generators on a site. If you've got a, thousands and thousands of people with solar panels on their roofs, right. it's going to be a little bit more complicated to make that all happen. There's a process there. Yeah, it <laughs> could take quite a while to get the whole grid up. Well, not only that, but you think if they're doing that, let's say they're starting like just bringing a little bit of capacity back online at a time. Somebody's lights turns back on and they turn the washing machine on and turn the dishwasher on and... Maybe you start to get a little bit of juice back in the system and then everybody turns this stuff on and it shuts the system down again. <laughs> you have like brownouts or something. Is that If a grid gets overloaded, what happens, well, what happens with mechanical generators is when you turn on more load, the generators will slow down a little bit. And it's a bit like when you're on the exercise bike and all of a sudden the program steps up to the higher level and you start pedaling slower to try to build your power back up. So it takes them a second to get back up to speed. And if they're all sort of operating at max capacity, then they can still keep running, but they will slow down. So what happens is that your frequency of your grid will drop from 60 hertz down to 55 hertz or something like that. And there's certain tolerances that the grid has built into it so that if it drops too low, then breakers will trip and all that. Yeah, and that's when you get another blackout or brownout or something like that. Right now we have these systems with centralized generation where you have, as you said, these big power plants in one location that then distribute out to a broad area over a network and the networks are all interconnected. But is there, are there advantages to having a more distributed power system where you have neighborhood by neighborhood generation 
where let's say that power isn't going as far over the lines, are there less transmission costs or are there is there more reliability or redundancy in the system if you do start to have more of a decentralized uh, grid? There can be. Um, it depends on, I mean, with it's a bit hard to say that about solar because solar is such an intermittent source of power. It's not a baseload source of power. Uh-huh. And anyone who's read anything that's critical of solar power will say, oh, well, you, you can't have baseload power with solar because it's too intermittent. You only get power when the sun shines, and then the rest of the time you, you need to be generating with coal or gas or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's true right now. There are technologies in development where people are taking solar and using either batteries or hydrogen storage and fuel cells and that sort of thing. Yeah. So what they can do is when the sun's shining, they can generate a ton of power and store a lot of it in these batteries. And then when it's nighttime or the sun goes behind a cloud or whatever, they can feed the grid off of these batteries back into the grid. Mm. And so there are some different commercial models, I guess, where that can work as well. And that's probably a whole uh, topic in itself. <laughs> I'm not too familiar with, with how that all works. I have seen that there are some technologies out there that they'll basically take like a shipping container with some solar panels on the roof and batteries inside, <laughs> stick it out in the middle of nowhere somewhere, hook it up to a transmission line. It's generating power during the day. And then if it's still a peak period in the evening time or whatever, it's uh, selling power back to the grid from the batteries. Well, generally those peak periods are during the day anyways, right? So that's when... You want to be generating more capacity. Yeah, but I think peak periods vary depending on your um, network service provider. Uh I think typically they'll go from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. or something like that will be peak. And, of course, seasons affect things too. If it's getting dark at 4 p.m., you'll be selling plenty of power off of those batteries into the grid. I worked on a project where one thing they were considering was... They were putting in a new central plant, mechanical plant for... This was a hospital. Mm Mm-hmm. And one of the things they were considering, because of the way that the peak pricing on their electricity worked, they were going to have chillers. So the chillers are what provide the cooling for the building, for the air conditioning. They were going to have chillers that they would run at nighttime, and they would actually use them to create ice. So they would have ice storage in the basement of the central plant. <laughs> Overnight, it would, it would, <laughs> they would create all of this ice, and then the next day... They would turn the chillers off and they would just run their cooling lines through, I don't know how physically how it would work, but basically their cooling lines would run through this ice or maybe that ice would start to melt and then yeah. you know, they have a pool of water underneath it that was cooled. And then they would use that to cool the building during the day. So essentially they would shift their peak usage of power for cooling to nighttime using ice for storage. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. <laughs> I don't think it got built, but they were they were serious about it. They you know they got pretty far in the design. Well, it. it's interesting. I mean, it, was there some sort of like vendor that had that technology that they were looking to sell these guys, or was it just? I wasn't too involved in this project, but I know that our engineers were working on the system. I don't know if it's a specific type of product that does this, but it's, it's something that's out there that people can do if they have a big difference between their peak electricity costs and their off-peak costs. Storing ice seems like a bit of a tricky proposition to me because of the fact that, you know, ice expands, pipes freeze, and they break and all that kind of thing. Like, <laughs> Well, they weren't freezing pipes. No, they literally were like creating like blocks of ice. Yeah, but it would have to be in, in some sort of vessel or something like that to contain the things, right? I guess so. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, suppose... uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. If, as I said, physically, I don't know how this thing would have worked, but... Yeah. I'm picturing like a big like ice maker like you have in your refrigerator that would just dump out ice cubes uh, yeah, you know, every uh, every hour to just dump out a new block of ice <laughs> and then they'd melt them down. What I find is that stuff like that, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> it, it technically it makes sense. It's a good idea. But when you look into all the sort of nuts and bolts that go into getting everything connected up and, and making it all work and control systems and all that stuff it just gets too hard and, and, and really it doesn't pay off. That's, that's been my experience. Cause I mean, it, you know, we do a lot of cogeneration and that sort of stuff. And, uh, we've looked into all kinds of different schemes like that. And, um, typically whatever's simplest tends to be what goes ahead or, or I should say whatever ends up being cheapest in CapEx terms is what goes ahead. Like my water heater. <laughs> that's right. You know, we looked at all these, all these options and at the end of the day, we just got the dumb one that, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just like we had before. So another question with, if you did have a more distributed grid, would the whole grid need to be reworked so that you had, let's say, I don't know if it'd be high voltage lines running down your street, but essentially you'd need more capacity in the wiring rather than have high voltage lines coming from plants that then break down to smaller lines as they get to your house. Would some of that need to be reworked and reversed in the grid? Would you need to 
reconfigure the whole grid to start to accommodate a much higher capacity of distributed generators? It's something that would really be specific to each situation and to kind of each neighborhood, I guess. Mm -hmm. If everyone is generating four times the capacity of what they're consuming at their house, then you could imagine that in your neighborhood, let's say there's one megawatt coming through a transformer and then moving it across the lines into everybody's houses or they're all taken off from those lines. Uh Uh-huh. So if you've got enough people in your neighborhood that you're collectively generating like four megawatts or net four megawatts, which you're feeding back to the grid, then those same lines now have to carry four times the load or four times the current to get back to the grid. Now, I would imagine that most power lines tend to be a bit over-designed and planned for future expansion and all that sort of stuff so that you'd have a bit of excess capacity available. But there's probably a certain tipping point at which you would have to upgrade all this other infrastructure such as the the transformers and the the lines and everything else. I don't think you'd have to change the voltages. I don't know what the voltages are are in the U.S., but in Australia, you've got your three phases at 415 volts. You might step up from there to something like 11 kilovolts for the transmission. And so you probably already have an 11 kV line coming down your street. If you look at at a power line and there's sort of the big fat lines down the bottom and then the little skinny lines up the top, the little skinny ones are actually the 11 kV and the fat ones, it would be your, your 415 V. Mm. And that's because um, at the higher voltage, you can use smaller cables because you've got less current. So I guess the upshot of that is there is a certain tipping point at which you would have to upgrade all this grid infrastructure in order to change the architecture from having consumers in a certain area to net producers and have the, all the lines and everything be able to carry the, the right amount of current instead of carrying it to those houses, be carrying it from those houses. Right. And so there would be some sort of cost involved with that. And I guess you get into some questions about, well, who covers that cost? Does that come out of the export tariff that you're getting for feeding back into the grid? I mean, I think that once you get to that point, the math probably starts to change where they're not, as you said, where they are starting to pay different amounts for what they're purchasing from you rather than what you're using from the grid. As I said, right now, it's a, at least for us, it's an even trade between what we produce and what we use. They just credit it to our bill. Yeah. So I would think that at some point that would start to change if they actually did have to start doing work on the systems. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, anything like this is a bit speculative and, and who knows what will happen. And I'm sure that all these problems can be addressed you know, over time. In a way, that's another issue with these sort of incentivization and bringing all this demand forward and bringing the adoption of the technology forward is that there are other aspects that are affected by this technology that may not be ready for it. Those things might take some time in order to be implemented cost effectively. Whereas if everything gets rushed and put in in a hurry, you've got all these knock on effects of other changes that have to be made elsewhere in the system. Typically, when you have to do things in a rush, it ends up costing a lot more than if you could do it over a scheduled longer period of time. So we've just spent the last hour discussing the problems with some of these government funding schemes for solar power. And this raises probably the most important question of this episode, which is, if Tim understands the problems that these schemes create, why is he supporting these programs by buying into them and putting the solar panels on his roof, which he can use to power the podcast that he uses to denounce the very government that gave him the subsidy in the first place? (laughs) Right. I think there's some legitimacy to that criticism. I mean... You could say that the approach I'm taking to get these solar panels on my roof is not the most anarchic possible way to do this. I suppose if I went out and rather than getting these grants, as we talked about, just went out and got a loan to finance it and make that cost payback work, I could do that. You know, Maybe I could crowdfund or crowdsource my <laughs> roof solar panel installation. And if I did that, then yeah, I wouldn't be dependent on the government for the installation of this system. But there's another side of this equation too. So let's think about it this way. As I said, I'm going to be getting back, I think, $10,500 in credits or rebates from the federal and state governments. Let's just look at the federal one. The federal rebate, I think, is about $7,500, which is a lot of money, right? That's the whole question here is that, isn't it hypocritical of me to be taking this huge amount of money from the government? Blood money. Right. (laughs) When I'm not necessarily supporting this whole program to begin with. But if we're all agreeing that that $7,500 is a lot of money for the government to be giving me, let me put it this way. I'm going to get that tax credit back in year one. So that huge amount of money, this $7,500 that the government is giving me, is what I've been giving the government every single year 
since I've been working and what I will continue to give them every year until I retire and then keep paying them after that. So yes, I agree that this is a huge amount of money to be taken from the government. I think it's an even bigger amount of money for the government to be taking from me. So the fact that I'm not giving it to them in one year out of the 40 some years I'm going to be working, I don't really see as a, uh, as a moral problem for someone who's opposed to funding government. So let's take that a bit further. If you want to try to live your life in an anarchic way where you're not supporting government, I think there are two dimensions to that. The first is to try to live your life as if government didn't exist. So that would mean that you're not taking advantage of government services, you're not relying on government funding. To an extreme, some people might say that they don't even pay taxes. I'm not necessarily going to recommend that. I think that anarchists can have a lot bigger impact on the world outside of prison than they can inside of prison. So I'm not necessarily recommending choosing not to pay your taxes. But there's a second strategy as well that I think can go hand in hand with the first strategy. The second strategy is to actively try to defund government. So unless you're choosing not to pay taxes outright, then if you're someone like me who does choose to pay taxes, then I'm going to look for every way to reduce those taxes to the minimum level possible so that I'm not funding government any more than the minimum amount required to keep me out of prison. <laughs> and honestly, I think this is what everybody does. I mean, is there anybody who is eligible for some tax deduction or tax credit that doesn't take it <laughs> on their tax return? Yeah, that's right. It's like you get all these people complaining about companies like Apple manage their finances so that all the profit shows up in Ireland or somewhere like that instead of the U.S. so that they don't have to pay any U.S. tax. Everything they do is perfectly legal and you know they're just doing the same thing that any individual would do to sort of take the housing deductions and, and the uh, standard deductions and, and whatever else they can do to reduce their own personal tax burden. It's just funny when you hear these sort of bizarre arguments from people who do support the state and think that paying taxes is some sort of moral obligation. Uh, other than just like a you know response to a threat, they come up with some pretty absurd perspectives on what's right and wrong regarding how much tax someone should pay. So that's the whole tax side of things. You know, I I think there's nothing wrong with taking advantage of some loophole the government gives you to reduce your own personal tax burden. I guess the second thing to consider there is, let's say this weren't a tax credit. When we look at something like, let's say, collecting unemployment, is it anarchic for someone to collect unemployment for a period of time from the government? And again, here I would say, what are the odds that the government is going to pay you more in unemployment than what they're going to take from you in taxes over your lifetime? To play devil's advocate here, of course, there are plenty of people who have worked out how to play the system so that they never pay any tax in because they never actually have a job and you know, live their whole life on unemployment benefits and, and that sort of thing. It sounds to me like you just described an anarchic hero, <laughs> somebody who is taking away from the government and using that income to run their life. Right. Either that or a government employee. <laughs> Basically the same thing. <laughs> well, no, I think the difference there is that the government employee is giving something back to the government. They're supporting what the government does. Arguably. <laughs> Very ineffectively. <laughs> You're making a few assumptions about their effectiveness. <laughs> <laughs> right, but they're, when it comes down to it, government employees are the ones who enable the government to do all the things that it does. Without IRS agents, there is no IRS. Without soldiers, there is no military. Well, pretty soon they'll all be robots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, true enough. <laughs> Without people who make the robots, all right. <laughs> there is no robot army. That's so true. So I think that working for government is a little different than something like collecting unemployment or taking advantage of some of these type of services offered by government. I mean, another way to think about this is the government's taking in all of this money from all of us by force. And then what are they doing with that money? Would you rather have them spending that money on wars and weapons and enforcement of bad laws and surveillance? Or would you rather have them just giving that money to people outright? I think that money is going to do a lot more good in some individuals' hands than it is in the hands of the government. And of course, just the fact that you're managing to save, say, 7500 bucks this year from the federal government's grimy paws, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be able to spend at 7500 bucks. It's not like they're going to be looking at some you know, military budget somewhere and going, oh, gee, I guess we can't buy that warhead this year. Going to have to wait till next <laughs> year for that one. Right. <laughs> I guess we can't spend a million dollars on this toilet Damn, this we're year. just 7500 bucks short. Well... <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have given that damn subsidy to Tim. Oh, well, let's let's not go to war instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to have a bake sale. Then maybe we can go to war in the, in the fall. 
<laughs> Maybe they could do a Kickstarter or something like that. So realistically, government has plenty of different avenues for funding. I mean, everything is kind of rested on, on the promise of future taxation, but there's plenty of money that they can get out of money markets and government bonds and even just straight monetization of government bonds by the Federal Reserve. People get into all these arguments about the details of how much tax someone pays or how effective it is if you don't pay your taxes. I mean, if you look at you know, how much of the government's budget is actually covered by taxes every year, it's probably some tiny proportion compared to all the other sources of income that they have. Most of which is debt. That's right. That debt is sold on the promise that future taxpayers will be able to cover the interest on it. The way that the government often funds itself is by issuing debt in the form of bonds. And to some extent, people on the market buy this, but when people on the market don't want to buy it at a given interest rate, then the Federal Reserve comes in and creates money out of thin air to buy the bonds. So essentially, the Federal Reserve acts as a money printing machine for the federal government. There's really no practical or theoretical limit on the amount of money that the government can raise for itself. And that limit on government is completely divorced from what they're able to collect from people in taxes in a given year. So listen, if anybody thinks that I'm propagating some kind of a scam here, as Joe said earlier, I have news for you. Our whole economy is a scam, or at least a whole system of scams. The money that's half of every transaction is created through this process I just described of printing it out of thin air. Not only that, but the Federal Reserve supports what's called the fractional reserve banking system, which simply means that every dollar you deposit in a bank account gets loaned out to 10 different people at the same time. So you can imagine what that kind of a scam does to prices in the economy, as well as to profits for banks. And again, money is half of every transaction. So every transaction in the economy is funded on this scam of fractional reserve banking and the Federal Reserve printing money. So tying this idea into the topic of energy, there are these subsidies for solar power and other types of green energy, but let's not forget that there's plenty of subsidies for, I guess, what you'd call dirty energy or fossil fuels or whatever as well. And this could range from specific subsidies to develop industries in certain states or in certain regions, such as land grants to oil companies to explore and develop oil wells or coal mines or anything like that. And you could make the argument that all these wars that are happening over in the Middle East actually have very little to do with any sort of principles or independence or democracy or any of that kind of nonsense. If you scratch the surface a little bit, you'll find there's, there's quite a few oil development companies and oil exploration companies uh, who happen to have a lot of friends in Congress who are doing very well off of these wars. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to get into too many specifics here, but look, I don't think there are too many people who disagree with the notion that at least part of the motivation for... U.S. military presence in the Middle East is to secure U.S. interests <laughs> in energy security based on the oil supplies in that area. I mean, the argument that the U.S. is going in there just to, to free people or to reduce conflicts in the area. I mean, there are plenty of places around the world where we could be doing that. I mean, look at some places in Africa. Oh, we'll be there soon enough. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once they find oil. Once they get all those robot <laughs> armies <laughs> built. <laughs> Right. So we, we don't need to dig too much into the hows and what fors of to what extent our military action is for the benefit of oil companies. I don't think too many people would disagree that those companies certainly do benefit from the military security that the United States government provides in those areas where they have business interests. When we think back again to the $7,500 that was spent on my solar panel installation, my guess is that the balance of accounts there between subsidies or services being provided to the solar industry are vastly outweighed by similar subsidies provided to fossil fuel companies. So you can imagine if all of these subsidies went away, both for solar and for fossil fuels, what would happen? Most likely the cost of those fossil fuels would go up and it would probably wouldn't take too long before they reached a point where solar could become much more competitive with them just on the basis of its market pricing alone. So if you think, as we have said, that all of these subsidies should be taken away from the solar arena, well, they should be taken away from the fossil fuel arena as well. This gets back to the sort of market distortions that we were speaking of earlier, where yes, we've got these market distortions that happen due to these solar scams, but these are just piled on top of all these other market distortions that have happened over the last 100, 200, 500 years 
from governments digging their hands into markets instead of letting consumers and businesses determine their own prices and conditions for what they want to buy. People who complain about problems with the free market, it's like we are so far from anything resembling a free market. We don't have a free market. We have a market consisting of a whole system of scams. If this solar power scam is the kind of scam that I'm able to take advantage of, just think about all the scams out there that we never even find out about. There are scams in solar power, there are scams in fossil fuels, there are scams in biofuels, there are scams in healthcare, in education, in transportation, in the food system, in banking, in finance. We don't have a free market, we don't have a free nation. We have a government of the scammers, by the scammers, and for the scammers. And if you're not a scammer, you're probably the one getting scammed. Well, that's all well and good, but I still think you're a hypocrite, and I don't like you. Yeah, I'm a hypocrite all the way to the bank. ducks walk from the Charles River to the Boston Common and Public Garden, but they need help from the government to get across the street. Spoiler alert, they make it across the street.